Okay, now let me just give me a second to share. Okay, I think we are live everywhere now. It looks like we got a few people tuning in. So if you are watching, please go ahead, drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. We love seeing where everybody is joining us from. All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to this month's TBI talk with Dr. Perry Maynard from Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. And today we're talking all about perseveration. Um, this is a word some of you may be very familiar with and others of you might be like, what is perseveration? What does that mean? Um, so we have Dr. Perry Maynard here today to answer those questions of what is perseveration, um, why do we do it, and what causes it, and how we can perhaps fix it. So welcome, Perry. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. And I think um, this will be a, a good one that not a lot of people talk about, but I think there's um, it doesn't just go towards what people might be thinking about of like looping on thoughts. It can be uh, looping on a, a lot of different things. And so we'll go into that, whether it's you know, perseveration of motion. So one gets out of a car and they feel like they're still moving uh, versus maybe someone keeps having a thought over and over again or a repetitive movement, right? I think perseveration can come in all shapes and forms, especially with uh, post head injuries or some sort of neurological disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And I know for me, the most common way I've heard perseveration um, referred to is like those circling thoughts and people that kind of, they're almost on repeat. Like they keep telling you the same thing, maybe just in different ways, yep. or they kind of start going down a rabbit hole. Like they start telling you about X, but then they kind of start cycling off into other things that they may or may not come back to their original point. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I guess those are the main ways I've heard it referred to, um, but it's interesting that you said too that that sense of moving and motion. Um, so yeah, so why don't you start by kind of breaking down what it is and, yeah. and perhaps what causes it? Definitely. So I think, you know, when we talk about perseveration just in, in the term itself, right, we're thinking about something that just continues to go on. So once again, like a perseveration of motion, it's a sense of motion that continues past the, the stimulus, or uh, it could be perseveration of a sensation. So you run your pinwheel down someone's face, and then they feel the sensation mm -hmm. for, you know, a minute afterwards, right? So it, it lasts after the point of stimulation, or you have a thought or a conversation and then you continue to loop on that, right? So it's just, it's a continuation or elongation, right? To think about. And so, you know, perseveration, depending on where it could be, we'll talk about a few different mechanisms. One of the biggest areas of the brain, a lot of times can be, um, or the way I look at it is um, the, the basal ganglia. So we've talked about this a lot with movement disorders, um, you see it with like ticks, OCD, things like that, right? So think of it as like your master computer processor where information's filtering in. And in simple terms, it's kind of like a, a gas and a break, right? And it's deciding what should you do? What should you not do? And also you can look at it, what you perceive. So like an extreme would be uh, like when you see people with things like hallucinations or uh, phantom hearing things that aren't necessarily there or feeling things that aren't necessarily there, right? Your brain is inducing this altered sense, right? And a lot of that, that basal ganglia should play a role in regulating that. And that's why it's not uncommon that people with maybe looping thoughts uh, may be super anxious. They may have other uh, OCD type tendencies. And one way you can think about it in regards to 
um, you know, thoughts or movement and things like that is that when I do something, my brain should have some sort of idea of a reward when I do something successful, right? Or I accomplish a task or something like that, right? And my brain should shoot dopamine to then give me a clue that I'm successful in that task. So sometimes you can see perseveration of thoughts or, I, or ideas because an individual can't complete a thought process or they can't, they, they can't complete something linear in their brain to where their brain feels like they've gotten from point A to point B. So they may continue to loop. And sometimes that can be because their brain is not getting a reward that maybe they accomplish this task. So it's kind of like similar with OCD, right? If I, you know, wash my hands, my brain should say, okay, your task was accomplished. But if there's alterations in those reward circuits, I may continue to do it. So if I don't get dopamine for doing this, but my goal was to wash my hands, but my brain's like, I don't think that was accomplished, do it again. And so I do it again. And then I do it again, or I touch the doorknob over and over and over again, or maybe I have a thought over and over and over again. Part of that can be that circuit, not putting an end to it by saying, okay, you've achieved the goal you're trying to get to, whether that's a movement, whether that's a thought, whether that's an emotion. So that can be kind of one area. And then another area very commonly when you see people with perseveration is that executive part of their brain, right? So more specifically, what's called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is kind of like your executive brain, right? It's what makes business executives, business executives. It allows us to be goal oriented, to stay on task, right? So you made a comment earlier about, you know, individuals, um, not either being able to shut off a thought or not being able to stay on task or going down rabbit holes, right? That dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has a ton to do with staying on task and staying on topic, right? And then that integrates with that basal ganglia and that dopamine to say, okay, are we reaching our goal? Are we staying on task? So once again, if I'm looping on a certain thought, there's probably something my brain is trying to solve or figure out. It may not make sense to me, but clearly my brain is trying to work through some sort of problem and that executive brain is not allowing me to have a linear thought process of how to achieve that goal. Once again, that goal could be picking up my water bottle. It could be uh, planning what I'm going to do for the day. It could be a million different things. So that executive brain can play a role as well. And this is a lot of times where you'll see individuals have maybe also depression associated. They may have slow reaction time, slowness of thought, uh, motivation issues, personality changes. Um, so I'd say those are two of the largest regions is these kind of more primitive areas of the brain start to kind of fire when they shouldn't fire. And they don't have this top down gating that should happen, right? Because there's always so much noise in our environment that our brain should be able to filter out things that are irrelevant. And that's really that job of that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and that basal ganglia is to filter out everything that's irrelevant to achieving whatever that goal may be. What's the goal? The goal can be a thought, a movement, an action, a plan, whatever it may be. And when that doesn't work, you may see things like looping or perseveration. Mm. And, you know, and talking about like OCD, I, mm -hmm. I had never thought of that in the, in the same vein as perseveration, but I totally get that. Yep. And it's, it's a common thing I see with people after brain injury. Um, I know for me, I don't know that I'd go so far as to say I had OCD, but like when we'd go out to eat my, my short-term memory was like very impaired and I, when we'd get up to leave, I would like triple check. Like, do I have my phone? Do I have my wallet? Do I have my keys? Mm -hmm. Because like, I would forget those things. I would just walk away without them. Um, you know, and so that, that's an interesting, um, you know, like I said, I've, I've seen a lot of people who develop OCD after brain injury and, mm -hmm. you know, is it a coping mechanism in some cases? Is it, uh, you know, perseveration is it like you said, the circuit like won't turn off. It wants you to complete that task. Well, and, that, and I think you bring up a, a great point um, in that. I, and that's kind of what I was, you know, with that executive brain is that 
you can have things that can look just like perseveration, but really it could be a, like a working memory issue. So like you talked about like mm. paying the check, grabbing your keys, closing your garage is more of that short-term working memory. So it's like that 10 second Tom from uh, 50 first dates, right? Hi, my name is Tom. Hi, my name is Tom, right? And, and you repeat and it's saying, are they really looping or are they completely forgetting that they just said that? Right. Yes. That's, that's a very different thing. So like I said, a lot of times these executive areas getting affected, there may be repeat behavior because you just don't know that you did that, you know, mm -hmm. and it can definitely be more of a memory issue. And if you can do things to improve short-term or working memory, then you might notice those things get better. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. I meet a lot of survivors and they will literally tell me the same thing like yeah. five times in like, you know, an hour. Um, and I can see where it's incredibly frustrating for people on the outside that aren't familiar with brain injury and the different ways that it can affect you. Um, and again, you know, is that working memory or is that mm -hmm. looping? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I know there's also when you're in a room full of TBI people, everybody's interrupting each other. Yep. And it's because they need to get it out right now. Well, some of it is they just need to get it out right now or they're going to forget it. And some of it is also impulse control, right? For sure. yep. um, <laughs> but a lot of times it's because it's like, oh, I need to tell you this now because I'll forget it otherwise. Yep. No, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And that is um, for sure, for sure true, whether it's impulse control, whether it's even just a uh, of being able to gate, right? That's the whole thing is like, can you gate and can you slow things down, right? No different than like a tremor or a movement, thoughts you need to gate, all of those different things. And these are the people like where you may have them like clap to a metronome really slow and they're mm -hmm. like, right? And they just want to go because that internal break isn't <laughs> slowing them down or being able to gate, right? That thought, that emotion, that mood, whatever it may be. Um, so I think that's, that's the big thing is, is the perseveration, there can definitely be true looping and perseveration, but there can be so many things I think can look like it. And the last big piece I think is also people's limbic systems, right? Their emotional brain. That's mm -hmm. a big thing. I think that becomes very wound up in individuals, one, because their executive brain might not be able to, to gate it. And two, a lot of individuals have suffered a ton of trauma, you know, so being, you know, having post-concussive issues for 10 to 20 years, I think going back to um, some of that looping is that you can just see sometimes there's unresolved emotional trauma. And it's almost like the brain is trying to play it to figure it out, but the brain's not really figuring out how do you compartmentalize that? How do you find the right filing cabinet to put it in there and understand and then resolve it? You know, and this is where I find a lot of like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, trauma therapy, things like that can be really, really helpful because people are looping on things from uh, that are a little bit more limbic or emotional, and they may not really key in on why that may be mm -hmm. occurring. I think this is going back to people's stories. I think sometimes it's largely like a traumatic thing or a limbic thing. And they're literally just looping over a traumatic event, right? And yeah. I think there's so much from like a subconscious conscious mechanism of trying to make sense, right? We have all this in the subconscious and our conscious brain is trying to make sense. But if your rational brain doesn't work anymore, you're now going to loop all these thoughts. You know, it's no different than like, I think it's fair to say that all of us have maybe some thoughts throughout the day. And you sometimes think you're like, thank God people can't read my mind, right? You know? It could be random things. Yeah. Could be someone cut you off or, or whatever it may be. Right. Uh, and then you see the uh, maybe the, the older individual who no longer has that filter. And then they start acting out on those things. Right. Maybe they do things that are sexually inappropriate. Maybe they say things that are questionably um, not very kind or maybe racially insensitive, whatever it may be. And it, you can look at it as that that executive brain is no longer gating all of these thoughts that are constantly going and saying, that makes sense, that makes sense. Don't say that, you can't say that in society. That's, that's not gonna be taken <laughs> well, um, you know? And so you, you see the loss of that in a lot of individuals. Um, and I think that's what you see with brain injuries too, is they lose that rational brain 
that should tell them what makes sense for this context. I'm having a conversation with a certain group of people. Maybe I shouldn't say certain things, or you know, maybe I should I should say it in a more appropriate way, uh, right? And a lot of individuals lose that. And that you know, I was talking with a patient this morning, and it's interesting because she was kind of saying that she was like, you know, I've just lost my ability to tolerate people, and I just say it how it is. I don't really sugarcoat things. I don't dance around. She's like, I just say it how it is. And it's like, that's so true. You see that so many times with brain injuries. I think some of it is they learn that life is short and maybe the way they've been living it, they don't like and now they want to change it because they have a new outlook on life. And sometimes is that filter is maybe not quite there anymore. And they're just willing to say it how it is. Um, you know, whether that's good or bad, I think, I think that's a common thing to see as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, what are some ways to help resolve some of these issues? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think, I think step one goes back to what we talked about is trying to figure out, does it seem to be a true looping? Does it seem to be a memory issue? Because if it's a memory issue, then that's where we want to look at doing things to improve short-term memory, working memory, or spatial memory. But um, let's just say maybe it is true, you know, perseveration or things like that. Um, you know, a lot of times what I'll do things to, you know, let's take, um, right, so maybe like a, a thought, right, perseverating on thoughts. And so the way I look at it is that thoughts and movement and all these different things, they use relatively the same loops, so they're, they're using the same circuit in the brain. So sometimes if someone's got, you know, these racing thoughts, I may do things with their body to gate and slow things down. This could be something as simple, and I kind of already brought this up, is something with like a metronome. And they're having to either move their hands or their body at a certain pace that's maybe slow, and they're getting visual visual reward of when they're doing it right and wrong. And what that does is help to feed their brain dopamine to say, that's correct, or that's wrong, figure it out. But we're using more of a motor loop to maybe slow down things. And sometimes using a motor loop can slow down things cognitively. But maybe you have something like a, a tremor, and then maybe you could use uh, a, a thought loop, right? So you can use all these different things to fix something that maybe is not uh, working per se, or what I'll do sometimes, let's say there's something with, um, you know, touch or something like that. Maybe what we have to do is recontextualize. So maybe every time I, you know, run this pinwheel down, there's an altered perception. Maybe we'll do some things with, you know, let's say mirror therapy, and they're watching me do it on the the good side, but it looks like their other side and the sensation is normal. And so we're retraining to get a normal sensation, but using another window into the brain. So um, I know it's not a direct, but this is where it can open up that there's so many different tools that where we can use things. But the big way I look at it is we have to give visual feedback of what's right, right? Because the problem is the brain's not figuring out what is right. So we need to either give visual feedback, auditory feedback, somatosensory or body feedback to try to normalize those loops so that they know this is right, this is wrong, okay, change this. Um, and so really the creativity and the amount of different things you can do is, is endless. It's just about finding a window into those pathways that does work to then fix the ones that don't seem to work as well. You know, it's interesting. I've been in different support groups across the country and I've seen different strategies strategies used um because you know in, in the beginning everybody has that chance to introduce themselves show their yep. story in inevitably somebody you know starts looping and going down a rabbit hole um and i know like some one of the support groups had like it was just like a stick that people could raise just gently raise it up if they felt the person was starting to like perseverate and yeah. it was just like a visual like Oh, okay. I'm done now. And, yep. you know, and it worked because it gave them that feedback yep. of, okay, you've already said this or you're going on and on. Yep. Um, yeah, and they, for the, they, the most they, they, part, yeah. And for the most part, they're just like, oh, okay, sorry. You know, yep. like they're not at all offended that, yeah. you know, you essentially told them wrap it up. 
Yeah, because I mean, they don't have that internal signal to once again, either give a reward that it's done, it's over, you've done this, you've already said this, or other loops that have to do with like errors. And it, once again, it's no different than movement that I keep trying to go to grab from my water bottle and I keep missing it. Why don't I learn? Why don't I figure it out, right? And that goes back into these motor loops, these reward loops. So like you said, it's like you're getting a visual target that's telling you stop, this is wrong, right? Because now you have a context to it. You know that that yellow pen means stop. So as soon as your brain says that, it cuts the loop. So yeah, that's, that's a, a great way. And that's the way you can look at it is just finding other ways to stop these loops. Mm -hmm. I know I traveled with a fellow TBI person on a trip and she told me it's like one of her first times traveling without her family and her family is really good at like, just kind of pointing out like, okay, shut up now you talk too long or, or, you know, whatever, like they just have like their little code of what they can yeah. say to her. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting too, how, you know, the whole family was kind of in on it and, and yeah. would help her when, you know, she was either going on too long or if she was kind of like saying one of her things was she'd kind of be inappropriate. She didn't yeah. have that filter. So she'd say things that maybe she shouldn't have said. Yeah, no, it's, you know, if anything, that's where, um, <laughs> you know, doing this job and seeing things, I try to give uh, some people grace sometimes and think, well, maybe they got a brain injury. Maybe that's why they mm -hmm. said that. I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to hope that that's the case. Um, but um, I think, I think those, those tools are, and can be um, super helpful. You know, there's sometimes too, you look at, uh, you look at people and there's some people that just to, like to also steal the conversation and then, uh, and then just tell you the same stories as well. I'm just thinking of some past friends and, uh, and roommates I had like that as well, where they just, uh, I don't think there's a brain injury, but they just, they loop on the same, uh, the same stories. Right. Right. All right. So let's take a look and see if anyone has any questions coming in. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, go ahead and drop a comment. If you have any questions, um, we have one person ask what type of doctor is is Perry. I was late to joining the call. Um, I'll, I'll let you um, yep. explain what you do, Perry. <laughs> Definitely. So I am a uh, chiropractic neurologist, which a lot of people are like, oh, what is that? So my original doctorate degree is in chiropractic. So uh, kind of manual medicine and things like that. But I also have a diplomate, which is a uh, kind of a postgraduate degree in clinical neuroscience. So with the chiropractic degree, I also have a clinical neuroscience degree and then also fellowships in traumatic brain injury rehab, and then also inner ear or vestibular rehab. Uh, and I'm actually working on a, a fellowship right now in a dysautonomia or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So um, to keep it simple, yeah, chiropractic neurologist, so all special, or kind of, if you think about doctors, right? MD, DO, DC, uh, things like that, they can all go in and specialize in different things. So it's the, it's the same, same neurology as medicine and all other uh, areas. You know, sometimes people think is like, is it a different type? Nope, it's the same stuff. It's just my doctorate is in chiropractic, but I have a clinical neuroscience degree along with some of those other things. Yeah. And uh, chiropractic neurologists are often also called functional neurologists. Yep. That is a, a big buzz term currently. Yes. And then I have another question. Um, could this be why sometimes I say something, but multiple people who heard me at the same time all heard me say something else? That would be a little bit different um, if, if almost like perception is not meeting reality, right? If you think you're doing something, but you don't actually do it, uh, that's different than perseverating, right? Perseverating is the continuation of something that's looping, right? It's it's a sense of motion, a sense of thought that continues to go versus that is more, there is something going on between perception and reality to where you think you say something in your brain, right? So if we think about this, like with anything, if I go to reach this water bottle, my brain says, okay, I want to grab that water bottle. What's the motor plan to do it? And then my brain says, okay, what should be the expected consequence when I do that? 
And then I get feedback from my arm to say, did I do it correctly? And so to me, there's more of an issue in that loop that you have a thought, you wanna do that thought, you tell that area of the brain, and then clearly that didn't come out and you didn't detect that that wasn't right and your brain didn't learn. So it's more in that motor learning loop that maybe something is going on, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else have any questions for Dr. Perry? Go ahead, drop it in the comment section here on Facebook. Um, thank you everyone who's been joining and chiming in today. This has been a great conversation. Um, Dr. Perry, are there any, you know, final thoughts you have for everyone watching? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about what is it and what causes it and different causes. Um, you know, but do you have any final thoughts for anyone watching who I'm going to be a little more specific here? Like maybe there's a caregiver watching. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this is what happens, right? Because yeah. like as a survivor, you might not be aware that you do these things. Some yeah. people do have that awareness, but a lot don't. Um, so maybe it's like a caregiver or loved one watching. Um, but what advice do you have? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think a few different things. I think one is, and not that people aren't, is that kind of... Um, I think being being patient with that individual and that something's because like you say, it can be very frustrating. It can be very frustrating for mm -hmm. everyone on the outside of I've heard that. Uh, you know, that you've said that before. So I think um, you know, being patient with that person and creating strategies kind of like you talked about of okay, how do we help you with this? Right. Not kind of saying, you know, shut up, stop talking. You said that, but how do we find ways to help, you know, that loved one or the caregiver help the person they're working with? Um, you know, because really there's something actually neurologically going on of why they may be, may be looping. I think another thing is, is trying to find uh, a good practitioner, because like we said, what I find is that a majority of TBI care is all palliative. It's how do I make the environment more friendly for you to live, which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. And I think it's really, really helpful but I am gonna challenge and say, how do we make you better? How do we maybe make you better to handle your environment? So it's kind of like someone's memory is bad, well, use sticky notes. Okay, sure, that works, but what about right. doing things to try to actually improve the memory, right? So going back to it with the perseveration, it's like seeking someone out to say, that's really gonna look and say, okay, is this an executive function thing? Is this a memory thing? Is this a, a looping? issue? Is this a, a motor learning issue? Because then you can find therapies that when they get in that loop, you maybe can stop and have them do, you know? So this one's good. I may have a patient that if they're starting to loop, and this is a common thing that I'll have them do is I'll actually have them alternate tapping their hands to like a metronome, uh, going like 30 beats yeah. per minute, but then I'll start to make it really, really complex to where their eyes and their tongue may be going opposite. So Right? So I start adding in all this complexity and it really forces the brain to start to be able to slow things down and say, I'm going to just focus on this because the problem is you're looping and we need to shift the attention away to something else. Right. And sometimes I'll play music. I'll make it more complex, but that's what I uh, um, kind of uh, call polytasking. It's something I'd actually picked up when I worked with uh, Dr. Zelinsky, uh, Glenn up in um, the PNW because uh, there's there a lot of looping patients up there. And um, I think polytasking, once again, not to say it's great for everyone, but it's something that I have found in a lot of cases, I think is really helpful. And some of the thought is that once again, you're starting to recruit some of these other patterns and you're slowing things down and you're gaining and you're shifting attention away. Sometimes we just need to shift attention. Yeah. So when someone's looping, find a way to shift their attention to a new thing and then get them on track there. Because if you don't, they're going to continue and continue and continue, um, you know, so that's kind of like a little, little exercise I like a lot of the times that most people handle pretty good uh, and actually can sometimes be helpful in slowing things down. Very cool. Um, yeah. So let me just see if there are any more questions. 
it doesn't look like, let me just hit refresh to make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, well, Dr. Perry, thank you so much for being here today. It's always a pleasure to have you here and share with everyone. And just again, anyone who maybe didn't catch the beginning, Dr. Perry Maynard at Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. And you do offer a free consultation, phone consultation for anyone who may be interested. You can find them at integratedbraincenters.com. And any final thoughts you want to add there, Perry? Uh, no, I think just like we said, the, the, the um, kind of end of every episode is that there's really people out there looking at the brain in a functional way. We far too long looked at it as static. It is what it is. My new kind of analogy I've been using with people is, you know, brain injuries almost, it's like your brain is like those old World War II, like phone circuit breakers, and you're putting wires in the right places. And the problem with head injuries is that you let like a five-year-old in to just move them every which way. <laughs> and you need to find a doctor that understands those pathways and how they can undo them and put them in the right spot. Because when you can do that, you can function better. And there's less of a need to um, make the, you know, compensate the world around you. And the goal should be to make you be able to handle the world a little bit better. Mm, right. Right. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Maynard. And thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you again next month. Thank you so much.